when I was in grad school, I uh, worked in a church, uh, and one of my jobs was visiting people in the hospital and stuff. And so there was this guy that I was called on to come and visit. He didn't go to our church, but he was related to somebody in the church. It was a real tragic thing that happened. His name was Gary. He was 21 years old, a young, vibrant, passionate uh, man, loved Jesus. He was six, to be married in six months, um, good-looking guy. He was a pastor of a youth group. But he was playing rugby with his youth group, and he tripped, and it was a freak accident, tripped. He broke his neck at just the wrong place, and the result was he was paralyzed from the neck down. And the doctors at that time said, there is nothing that we can do, nothing medicine can do for him. This is a permanent condition. It was just terrible. Um, now, the thing is, is that, that I went to visit him and talked with him, and, and I quickly found out that he went to a church it's sometimes called word faith churches, where they take this certainty seeking or strength tester model of faith, faith that's seeking certainty, and they, they take it to an extreme where they, they teach that if you are absolutely, if you have faith and you're absolutely certain that God's going to heal you, you will be healed. Uh, and if you have faith that you're going to be prosperous, you will be prosperous. Uh, that, that it's all about hitting that magical level of certainty and bam, it's got to happen. Which means that if, if you're not healed, it's because you lack faith. Or if you're not prosperous, it's because you lack faith. So talking to Gary, his response, to, he, what he said to me is, I am gonna get, I'm going to walk out of here in perfect health. I'm going to walk out of here in perfect health uh, as soon as I get my faith in order. I'm just, I, 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 I must still be wavering because I'm not healed yet, but I am going to have faith. I know, I know, I know, I know that I am going to walk out of here in perfect health. And the people who visited him would support him in that view. In fact, one his pastor said to him, yeah, your state of paralysis is just an illusion created by the devil. You really already are, are healed. And as soon as you have enough faith to receive that healing, then you'll, be, then you'll walk out of here. It comes to the same thing, basically. Have enough faith and you will be healed. And the picture of God I get in my mind, I got in my mind, uh, was, and I get this whenever I talk with people who have this sort of theology, is that here God is up in heaven, and God is holding out healing this guy until he gets enough psychological certainty. You can do this little psychological trick in your head. Make yourself certain that I will heal you, and I will heal you. And it, it's, it, it's sort of like a, a form of psychological torture. you got to do this trick for me, and then, I, then, then I'll give you the healing, and you can get on with your life. But not until you do this trick. Convince yourself that it will be so. And not only is that a form of psychological torture, it's, it's, it's impossible if you're honest with yourself. How can you be certain that you will be healed? I suppose it could be a divine word of knowledge or something, but apparently God didn't give him that. Um, because see, here's the thing, people of faith, of strong faith, like the apostles, they had terrible stuff happen to them. Uh, throughout history, people of faith have had you know, accidents and weren't healed from them, and, and they were burned alive at the stake, or fed to lions or came down with an illness and died. That happens all throughout history. And so if it happens to people of faith throughout history, how do you know for sure that you being a person of faith, that this, it's not going to happen like that? How can you be certain? I, I don't think you can be. So here God is up in heaven saying, do the psychological trick and I'll heal you. And by the way, the psychological, psychological trick is impossible for humans. If, if God were to download a, a word of knowledge, that would work but apparently he won't do that either. So it seems to me that this picture of God is more like El Capone than it is of Jesus Christ, frankly. And, and, and I don't recall Jesus ever playing psychological tricks with people or asking people to believe something in the face of all the evidence to the contrary. How are you supposed to believe that, that you're healed when you're laying and you can't move your toe? I mean, that is, that's impossible. And Jesus never does stuff like that. Remember the time in Mark 9 when he was uh, uh, praying for this blind man? It was a really odd story because the guy was blind, and, and so Jesus, he spit on the ground and made some mud out of it and puts it in his eye sockets. Um, and then he prays for the guy, and, and, and then, then he says, can you see? And the guy says, well, not so good. Um, I see, like, people, but they, they, they're like tree stumps. It's probably because Jesus just put a bunch of mud in his eyes. I mean, <laughs> wash all your eyes, and then they can see better. But th what Jesus did, though, see, he didn't rebuke the guy saying, where's your faith? You should be believing with certainty that you have been healed, and then you'll be healed. No, he doesn't do that. He says, okay, well, then let's pray again. And he goes at it a second time, and the second time is a charm. 
Uh, even the Son of God had to persevere in prayer sometimes to come against the stuff he had to come against. And so it's just not consistent with the character of God or the ministry of Jesus to have this idea that if you just do the psychological trick then you, and move that puck up the, the, the strength tester enough, well, then you, you'll, you'll get your salvation, then you'll get your healing, and then you'll get your whatever, whatever, whatever. And why is, why is by the way, the psychological certainty a, a virtue? What is virtuous about that? Why would God leverage everything, heaven and hell and healing, on how psychologically certain you can make yourself. Why is it virtuous to be able to do that? It seems to me that the people who are good at that are very simple people or delusional people. They're really good at, at convincing themselves of things that aren't real, you know? But why is that a virtue? And the ones who are bad at it tend to be rational people who are uh, balanced. And why would God be prejudiced against rational, balanced people? What's he, why, why does he stack the deck against rational and balanced people? He's the one who made them rational and balanced. And why throughout the Bible does God treat people as rational people? He, tells, he, he says, use your mind. Come let us reason. He wants us to think. He's not against thinking. Uh, and, and so what is this thing with psychological certainty that God leverages everything on that? Uh, it, just, it just doesn't fit the character uh, of God that we're found, it's found in Jesus. So here's the second thing. Uh, th this view can cause people to have a learning phobia. And here's why. If, if heaven and hell and everything else hangs on your psychological certainty and doubt is evil and of the devil, well, then you're going to avoid doubt like the plagues. So you're going to avoid anything that might cause you doubt. And reading books that are not from the perspective that you hold, that might cause you doubt. Reading books that object to Christianity, that might cause you doubt. Becoming close friends with people who aren't Christians, that might cause you doubt. You, you don't want to a, a be curious about other positions and other views and find out what other people genuinely think because it might cause you to doubt. So if you have to be in dialogue with somebody who has a different opinion of yours or have to read a book that has a different opinion than yours, you're not going to be genuinely empathetic as you talk with the person or read the book. Really trying to find out what's their perspective and why don't they believe the way I believe. And you're not going to really be trying to genuinely get on the inside of them because you'll be too busy refuting them. You're, 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 you're just hearing for the sake of, of refuting because you have to protect, you have to protect this, this faith. You don't want any kind of doubt to come in the, in the way. This may be one reason why it is true that conservative Christians tend to have a reputation for being narrow-minded and not being able to uh, appreciate other perspectives. Um, it, it tends to be insulated. This kind of view, I, I've seen parents who inflict this on their children where they just want to protect their children from anything that could possibly cause their kids to ever uh, question their faith. So they only get their beliefs reinforced. And in this world, folks, maybe a hundred years ago it wasn't this way, but in this world today, that's a dangerous way to raise children. Because sooner or later, the complex, ambiguous world of questions and objections is going to find them out. Which leads to my third point. This view sets people up for a fall. And I've seen this happen way too many times, especially with young people. What happens is that, that uh, having a certainty-seeking faith, where you, you see certainty as a virtue and doubt as evil, well, it, it doesn't prepare you to deal with the real world that we live in today, where you are going to, unless you are an ostrich on steroids with your head in the ground, you are going to bump into people who have different opinions than you and, and have different religion than you. And, and, and sometimes the virtue of their life will call into question the, the authenticity of your own. And if you're in dialogue with people, you're going to find objections. Or you get on the internet, you're going to find people who have you know, raised problems that you're going to have to deal with. We live in a complex, pluralistic, globalized, internet uh, a world that's filled with ambiguity and questions. And that's just the way this world is. But see, this certainty-seeking faith doesn't do anything to prepare people to deal with that. In fact, it motivates them to run away from it. And that's why they got a learning phobia. But in this world, that can only last so long. And once they have to face the ambiguity of the world, their faith can come crashing down on them. What usually happens is, is, is and I've seen this happen a number of times, where a person... They lock in on their faith, say, in seventh grade. Could happen at any time in life. But now they're going to try to remain certain about those beliefs. Here's the, here are the saving doctrines that you need to be certain of uh, in order to, or at least close to certain, in order to be saved. So salvation's at stake here. So people then live out their life trying to remain certain of these beliefs. And they don't let the questions and the problems and objections and, or anything modify those beliefs because that would require them to doubt. And so they can be very intelligent in other ways. I've met people with PhDs in, in, in different fields, but when you talk to them about theology, they're virtually in seventh grade. They haven't thought it through. They give the same answers they would give in seventh grade. Nothing's been modified because it's been insulated out of fear. But then what can happen is sooner or later, they have to face this ambiguous world. And because they're not prepared for it, and they think certainty is the goal, then as soon as they start to doubt, the whole thing goes out the window. 
And um, I, this is one of the major reasons why I think millennials are leaving the faith. They find this world that has got all sorts of questions and ambiguity, whatever, and their seventh grade fa faith is just too small for the big world. So it's so important to always be growing in your faith, thinking through issues, dealing with issues, so, so that you, you don't have this, you're trying to pour the, the wine of the world into the wineskin of a seventh grade theology, and that's going to burst it apart. It just doesn't work. And finally, the fourth objection is probably the most serious. In fact, for sure it's the most serious. And that is that certainty seeking faith is idolatrous. And I'm not saying anything about the people who have certainty seeking faith. I'm sure they're godly and have sincere motives. But it doesn't change the fact that this way of doing faith is idolatrous. It's not godly. Now, here's why. An idol is anything that plays a role that only God should play in our life. And the major role that God's supposed to play in our life is to be our source of life. And by that I mean he's, he's a source of the, our core identity, our core sense of worth, our core sense of well-being, our core sense of security, our core sense of being fully alive. Everyone hungers for that. That's life. And God created us with that hunger because he wants to be, he wants to fill it. And he's the only one who really can fill it. But see, if we're not getting our life from God, as he's revealed in Christ, we've got to get it from some other source. And secular folks... They'll get, they'll, 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 they get their life and security and worth and significance by what people think about them, by how sexy they are, by how smart they are, by how successful they are, how much money they earn, how big their house is, how big their boat is, how good they can throw a football, whatever. There's a million ways of getting that need, attempting to get that need met. But religious people who aren't into the secular stuff, the main way they have always done it, got their worth and security, is by being right. We are the ones who believe the right things, and we're sure of it. Trouble is, so, is, uh, so are all the religious people, and that's why they go to war. Um, we're sure of it. You know? and so what gives us life is we know, we do believe, we do believe, we do, we do, we do believe, that we are the people of God because we believe the right things as opposed to those heretics over there who believe the wrong things and are going to hell. They're not getting life out of their love relationship with God. They're getting life from what they think about God, from the fact that they think they're right about God. That is an idol. That is an idol. They're getting life from a false source of life. This is why you may have noticed that when you get into debates or dialogues with people, certain religious people who are certain they're right, uh, very quickly it can get acrimonious. They can get very nasty. They're very angry. It's hard to have a calm, rational discussion over coffee with, with, with some kinds of religious people. Because uh, it's not just about their opinion. It's about their source of life. And whenever you start poking at someone's idol, their prefrontal lobe cortex that does all the rational reasoning, it shuts down. And what gets activated is their amygdala, which is their fight or flight reflex. Uh, you protect your God at all costs. You know, this is everything to you. And so they get very, very angry when, if you start, especially if you're, if you're poking legitimate uh, objections against their view. The, the, the more plausible you are, the more angry they get because it's starting to shake them and they've got to protect their idol. Remaining certain is, is all important. This is also why certain conservative Christian leaders who are the guardians of the flock, they get so aggressive and acrimonious going after heresy. Uh, anything that disagrees with their view is her uh, heresy, and, and they'll go out of their way and do whatever it takes to try to bury you because they, they don't want other people finding out about your view because that might infect them, and uh, they know they're right. So they want to be the ones that affect everybody. No one else is allowed to influence people. Back in the good old days, you could just burn them alive. Now you can't do that, so, well, not in this country anyway, so you've got to use other means of, of uh, going after them. But this is why. It's, it's, it's not just about opinion. They're not okay just saying, hey, let's just discuss this openly, and truth will, will rise to the surface. You know, rational people can come to their own conclusions. No way! They, want to, they have to enforce it. God, people are too stupid to think for themselves. We must protect them from these heretics. And so it goes, and so it goes. It is idolatry. It ought to be the case, folks. That we get life from one source, and that is the God who's revealed on the cross, reveals his character, reveals what he thinks about us, and that should be the source of everything. And, and it, it shouldn't require us to be certain about that or try to make ourselves certain about that. No, it, see, the God who's revealed on the cross, I don't get life from my belief about the cross. I, I believe in the cross, and therefore I get life from the cross. Uh, it's not about the rightness of my view. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, I don't need to be certain of this. I just need to be confident enough to commit to living this way. And, li and, and, and entering into a relationship and trusting in the character of God and, and uh, by his grace walking trustworthy with God. And that then, uh, the wholeness of life that comes out of the relationship gives you life and gives you worth and gives you significance and transforms you. But don't get life about what you think about God. Get life from God, <laughs> uh, the real thing. 
And it's so much more refreshing than having to protect an idol of rightness.